advancing asset performance modeling through BIM. But what's BIM and how would it be relevant? And I might say it would help us advance from asset performance management to asset performance modeling, but that sounds like it could take a lot of explaining. And there's a clock in front of me there. A, a, a rap talk is short, so, and it's my first rap talk as well. Maybe it's your first rap talk. I sort of, I think it is. So earlier uh, this morning, um, Terry mentioned my colleague, Chris Barron. He helps me with these presentations. And, and uh, so I explained the subject, and it's a rap talk. He thought he could help. Let's see. Yo, Terry, what's up? Down in IMC, I'm telling them that it's BIM, the technology. I mean, B to the I, and it's I to the M. A rap talk and asset management through BIM. Building information model, acronym BIM. Information isn't stationary when it's in BIM. Never dawdle, get your model, get your model in BIM. And your APM and RCM are better with BIM. A rap talk and asset management through BIM. A rap talk. BIM. Rap talk. A rap talk and asset management through BIM. A rap BIM. talk. Rap talk. And I thought, some of you don't know of our company. Our, our mission is sustaining infrastructure. And infrastructure we define as everything that we as engineers engineer and build and, and operate to improve the world and improve the quality of, of life in it. Terry's uh, triple bottom line. Uh, that's been our mission for the 30 years. We just celebrated uh, our company's birthday. We started with five Bentley brothers. The other four are engineers who would fit in one car, I think, if, if that's the car. And, and now we're 3,200 folks all over the world. Uh, and we're, we are located in the world where you and your work and your assets are, except that we don't have anything particularly to do with Nevada, <laughs> by the way. Uh, we're, not, we're not Bentley, Nevada. So over those 30 years, in, in terms of sustaining, we're now uh, the 43rd largest software company in the world, which means only that you should expect a lot from us where we apply ourselves. Uh, it, it happens to be in a lot of the same domains uh, where, where your work is. Uh, and we're glad to be number one in engineering design tools. But we would most aspire, uh, because all the value is generated in operations, to be also number one in the forthcoming ARC reliability study. And we'll have to wait to mid next year uh, for that. But our work in infrastructure are for solutions. This, if you like, is our playbook of software uh, to help you on your projects and assets uh, throughout the world in all of these uh, project and asset types. And, and we say that starts with our microstation and engineering applications, information modeling applications, and then by way of servers for collaboration for integrated projects, but ultimately through our asset-wise services for intelligent infrastructure all enabled by information mobility. Mobility of people is good, but information uh, mobility can uh, greatly empower them. And so who are we empowering? We do something else unique, which is we tabulate the top 500 owners of infrastructure in the world. And we've just issued the annual update, which you can find on the web. And you may be interested to look to see whether perhaps your organization is among the top 500 ranked by net tangible asset value. Uh, and uh, we don't think anyone else tabulates that. It's $16 trillion of asset value for us collectively to help with. Interestingly, the bulk of the organizations and the asset value is in private uh, ownership. And it breaks down like this in terms of the domains of opportunity uh, for asset performance management among these uh, top 500 owners. So for us, because it ultimately is about adding value during infrastructure uh, operations, it was uh, great for us a couple of years ago to complete the reach, if you like, in our Ivara acquisition to be able to integrate OpEx with CapEx, as we say, to redefine asset performance management. And many of you take advantage of our software off offerings uh, for that. And it happens that uh, on Friday, in the Asset Performance Management Summer Summit, uh, many users will be speaking. So I'm not going to say much about what we do in this regard. Uh, they will. One such presentation will include Shell and their way of looking at structural integrity leadership. And I think it's interesting 
uh, when we talk about triple bottom lines and, and how things come together, uh, that integrity can mean so many things at once, but it would mean for Shell here that structural integrity involves not only what we engineer and then build, uh, but operate together. So Shell, by the way, is top owner uh, number five. So it happens we had an infrastructure asset performance summit uh, last month, a month ago in London at our year in infrastructure conference, and Terry moderated that. Uh, I think it went very well. There is a report out, the IAP summit report, that's now available for you here on Friday. I suggest it would be worth your while to have a look at that. So we have uh, a B-inspired competition each year with hundreds of nominated projects in the world. A jury, the jurors chose uh, this uh, Severn Trent Water uh, project as the winner in asset performance innovation. And there, uh, they do 88,000 street works a year in the UK. You have to electronically report that uh, to the, in their case, the seven highway authorities they work with, and software helps them do that at the same time as keeping their mobile crews uh, in the loop. And for uh, top firm number 44 is Network Rail, and this award was just given. It's the prestigious Institution of Engineering and Technology Award in the UK to Network Rail. Uh, there's uh, my colleague Andy Smith, our Rail Solutions Executive. This award for the Orbis Lads project, uh, all about improving Network Rail's maintenance decisions to save 750 million pounds uh, for UK uh, constituents. So here's the, where, the way Network Rail saw the challenge was to improve uh, maintenance decisions so the right work got done at the right time. The innovation in terms of technology was to bring together for the first time through our AssetWise Optram platform the uh, engineering data, if you like, the condition data, and then the maintenance history and the results of those interventions. So in particular, uh, they would do less rote and routine maintenance and more condition dependent maintenance, which is saving now in terms of CapEx by making projects simpler and also OpEx uh, a great deal uh, per year already. But what is most delightful about this project literally are the maintenance decision makers as you're in your organization are the superintendents in the field. Uh, they now have tablet devices. This is not new software. The result is new because now it's their data. It's supporting their decisions when they're in the field making these decisions. And I suggest that's an insight for us to take away. Well, what then is BIM? So uh, top, uh, top owner number seven is the highways agency in the UK. And we announced at our conference that we are, have created an AssetWise Academy for BIM enablement of asset management to help the highways agency use our uh, environment to improve their maintenance operations. And this turns out to be a priority in the UK. This is the British Standards uh, Organization where building information modeling is now aimed at the operational phase of an asset in a process that began in 2011 where to save construction costs the UK determined to require by 2016 BIM levels that uh, began with construction, but then rep uh, recognizing that 85% of whole life cost is in operations and maintenance. This newest standard starts with the standard for design collaboration, then construction, but now by way of ISO 55000 to uh, operations. So that suggests to us a, a generous definition of BIM as we look at it at Bentley as follows. So we say BIM can stand for better performing assets at the same time as better performing projects. And IM for better performing assets would have to do with greater depth of information mobility, levels of abstraction in, in, uh, in what information means. At the same time, greater breadth of information mobility across this span of advancements. So it would start on these axes with design and, and visualization, then through construction and simulation, 
and ultimately for operations. And our, our excitement at Bentley Systems is that the advances are cumulative and reinforcing ultimately to improve asset operations. So if that's my premise, can we substantiate that? So let's start with design modeling. And so the jury's a winner in water treatment plants for design modeling was this project where operations were improved in this plant which hadn't even desi been designed, let alone constructed. So how could that be the case? And the answer is that the operator you see in this plant is virtual and he's using uh, an immersive uh, device to help contribute to improving the design for operations. And so Waterworld recognized this project also, uh, first of all, for saving money uh, in design and construction, but avoiding uh, problems during operations by involving immersively in the context of the plant the operations folks. What about construction modeling? How would that help in operations? Well, all of your operating facilities should have a 3D model, which can start with a laser scan point cloud model as here. And, and for an operations task such as replacing this failing pressure vessel uh, with a new one, you would use your as operated 3D model, for instance, in this case, to simulate the steps involved in uh, removing uh, the vessel safely. And, and then would consider, for instance, this newly designed. So here's the design model of the new safe vessel, but simulate how it comes to the site. And in this case, the interferences found there in yellow uh, during transport, you would use this construction modeling approach, your 3D model, to say, well, that could be solved as simply as here by rotating and reconfiguring the vessel and confirming that then you could safely uh, transport it here and, and then configure it, find the interferences which would occur during installation, for instance, on this control panel, and then go into your the same environment as your design environment to make the changes required to solve those clearances in order to be able to safely and effectively uh, do that operations task uh, without extending uh, the downtime uh, in the plant. Now reality modeling would take that even further into uh, the operations life cycle. So here we announced last month that we and Siemens have joined forces so that for instance to take again this is an as operated model in an auto plant and you could now for instance embed the laser scanners in your plant so that there is always an as operated model of this sort. But how could you use it in an innovative way? And that's what we and Siemens teamed up here to do. So this is now the software environment of the process planner who's helping update this work cell in that factory uh, for a new model change. And here he's able to bring in the digital infrastructure of the, fa of the factory so that he's making decisions about the design, in this case, of the configuration of the work cell and the robots. Uh, in the context of and with visibility into the actual as operated conditions in the plant so that for instance when he's working out uh, through his Siemens software the swept path of the robot he can make sure it doesn't interfere with the utilities and is ideally situated uh, to simulate the performance of those operating assets uh, in the plant. So that's reality modeling all the way through uh, whole life, uh, if you like. And then analytical modeling. So in this case, United Utilities uses our hydraulics and hydrology model of their water network. And here to instrument it, they worked out that they would need 12 loggers. Well, we have a piece of software we call Darwin because it does genetic algorithms that permutes and evolves a design. And we worked out that they could get by with six loggers only and have as much information value. And the information value here in this case came about when they opened hydrants in succession and read the, the loggers to then say what 
and using now this genetic algorithm to say, we know what the design model is. Let's evolve that design model so that we produce readings at the loggers consistent with what we're actually observing when we open those hydrants, which will be a different model than was the basis of our design. It's different because there's breakage, there's corrosion, and there's leakage. So the result was to identify in red where there probably are leaks. They then used the sounding devices that, that water professionals do to find the actual leaks in close coincidence to that and worked out that if they had only used the devices and not the genetic algorithm model, they would have taken four times as long uh, to find those leaks. So the model contributing throughout operation. So where do we want to go with asset performance modeling? Well, the answer would be that in the field, uh, the engineer would, would want to know the spatial context, where there are alarms, where there might be failures, and then be able to drill in to what we call I models, the actual engineering models in 3D and 2D and with the associated data, and find in this case where there is a incipient failure uh, and, and look in particular in an inspection mode at the failure modes and, and history pertaining to that component and be able to make decisions in the field about uh, safety and asset performance. So here's Chris Barron. And he's not off the hook yet because it turns out that Chris uh, put himself through architecture school by working on one of your maintenance tech teams. He really did. Uh, he was reading gauges and bringing fans in when things were too hot. So Chris said, here's how asset performance modeling could have helped me do a better job uh, for you. So he's in the plant. Uh, and you might say that Chris and his device here, in effect, are a cursor into the virtual model, which exists corresponding to this physical plant. So he could say, well, what's inquire on his device happens to look like a tablet. It won't look like a tablet for long. They'll, they'll, they won't be able to recognize a computer. But he could say, well, what's near me if I'm doing inspections? And it might be this electrical panel. But he'd have access to all of the information mobility modeled related to that electrical panel, including the work orders and the schematics. And he could say, what about the chiller piping here? And there, uh, he'd have access, by the way, to the pipe stress models, the Bentley software used for that, and everything up and including the failure modes and effects pertaining there in that plant. There would be sensors uh, that he'd know about. From the librarian, he could then extract his view, literally, this cursor into the, uh, into the digital corresponding asset performance model uh, to advance asset performance modeling through BIM. And time is short. It just says minus two seconds. So I invite you to join us at our exhibition and the expo to learn more about asset performance modeling. Thank you.